Welcome to Accessibility Summer Camp Pre-Conference. Accessibility Summer Camp is brought to you by our gold sponsors, Anthology and Innovative Educators, and our silver sponsors, Concourse Syllabus, D2L, Instructure, Open LMS, Packback, Simple Syllabus, and the WSU Tech Foundation. This conference would not be possible at no cost without the support of these fine businesses and individuals. If you are posting on social media, please use the hashtag AccessibilityICT2023. This is pre-conference session three, the history of accessibility presented by Jian Wild, CEO of Accessibility Oz. Jian? Welcome to sunny Queensland. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction, Crystal. I'm really happy to be here at Accessibility Summer Camp. I'm actually doing a second session later on. Uh, and I would like to just say that everything that I have to say here are my own thoughts and views. A little tongue in cheek. Uh, please don't uh, attribute them to anyone except for myself. So thank you so much for having me here and let's get started. So uh, the first thing that I'd like to say is that you can access the slides and links at pz.tt slash history 23. Now I have talking to I have been talking to these people for what it seems like years to make their system accessible. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, to make their system accessible and I haven't uh, gotten very far. So please let me know if you uh, want to have access to the slides in a different way. I can email them to you. Uh, I also, any links that I might mention uh, will also be uh, in that, that uh, present link as well. So pz.tt slash history 23. So let's get started. Uh, accessibility obviously has been around for a very long time, uh, but really web accessibility started in 1995 uh, with the Unified Website Accessibility Guidelines. Now, these were compiled by Greg van, van der Heiden and developed by a number of people in the accessibility industry uh, in their own time. So accessibility is very much one of those, uh, one of the, am I sharing my screen? Yes, you are. Ah, oh, excellent. Okay, sorry. <laughs> You're all right. <clears throat> so accessibility really started uh, getting prominence in 1995 with the Unified Website Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, these were compiled by Greg van der Heiden and developed by a range of people in the accessibility industry with no kind of input or direction from any policy bodies. Uh, it came from a discussion between Tim Berners-Lee, who is the founder of the World Wide Web, and Mike Passiello, who, of course, is an absolute titan in the accessibility industry. So Tim went to a pre-conference workshop run by Mike at the WWW conference and uh, about disability and accessibility uh, or access to uh, the internet. And then he mentioned disability access in his keynote. So that the first version was released in uh, 1995 and version eight was released in 1998. Uh, and that was the starting point for WCAG one. So it definitely moved a lot faster than the current accessibility guidelines, eight versions in three years. Uh, and WCAG 1 was basically based on these unified website accessibility guidelines. So in 1997, the Web Accessibility Initiative, uh, a division of the W3C, was created. And so that really meant that uh, policy could take over this web accessibility. And 1998, along with uh, that, that set of guidelines being handed over to the W3C was also the beginning of Section 508. So Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton, signed the Workfa Workforce Investment Act into law, which was basically Section 508. And this required accessibility for electronic and IT for all federal pur uh, purchases. And of course, uh, the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative started working on WCAG 1. Hmm. 
a year later, WCAG 1 was released. Uh, it wasn't uh, all that complicated. However, it was seen to be very complicated at the time. Uh, so it was released in 1999. There were 14 guidelines with 65 checkpoints, and it was not technology independent. It referenced things like client-side and server-side image maps and re required that there were, say, for example, no click here links. This is the entirety of WCAG 1 level A. So you can see it's broken up into things like in general, uh, if you use images and image maps, if you use tables, if you use frames, if you use applets and scripts, if you use multimedia, and then the famous and if all else fails checkpoint, which says, if after best efforts, you cannot create an accessible page, provide a link to an alternative page that uses W3C technologies, is accessible, has equivalent information or functionality, and is updated as often as the inaccessible original page. And so this has really been the source of a lot of problems in the accessibility industry, because the, when it comes to WCAG 2, there's no such kind of get out of jail free uh, checkpoint or success criterion. But a lot of people who worked with WCAG 1 uh, kind of have that in the back of their mind. So this is really, I believe, the source of things like having a separate site for people with disabilities, uh, you know, which has gotten a number of organisations into trouble. So this is something that really came from WCAG 1 that uh, was not replicated in WCAG 2 uh, that uh, people still do think about. Another thing about WCAG 1 is that you had to make sure that pages were usable when scripts, applets or other programmatic objects are turned off or not supported. Uh, and then, of course, if this is not possible, provide equivalent information on an alternative accessible page. Now, that was there because screen readers, and of course, there are very few, many fewer screen readers in the market back then, it was basically JAWS and voiceover, um, basically just really JAWS. Uh, didn't interpret JavaScript. So if you wanted to make a site that was accessible to a screen reader, you needed to make sure that the site worked entirely with JavaScript disabled. Now, the screen readers with a lot of uh, donations from people did work on that very hard and have actually changed it as, of course, we all know, do uh, now interpret JavaScript properly, which is fantastic. Uh, and it's uh, something that's really kind of a major change from WCAG 1 and WCAG 2. So in 2001, the VPAT, the Voluntary Product Assessment Template version one was released, which was developed in partnership with the US government, the General Services Administration, and the Information Technology Industry Council. Uh, and prior to that, one of the things that brought that about was <coughs> one of the things that brought that about was the two, the first accessibility litigation. So this actually happened in Australia, and it's not the reason that I got into accessibility. I actually was in uh, the accessibility industry as of 1998, so before WCAG was released. Uh, I basically... Uh, worked on the first Australian accessible website by going and interviewing people and finding out how it was that they used computers, mainly people who were blind because that's what we thought people with disabilities uh, really meant at that point, especially when it came to a website. And of course, we know better. I know better now as well. But in 2000, uh, the very first accessibility litigation really lit a fire uh, for the accessibility um, industry. So it was based on a guy called Bruce McGuire, who was vision impaired, reliant on a screen reader, and he wanted to buy tickets to see the Olympic Games in Sydney, the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games. And uh, he couldn't uh, because they used JavaScript for navigation. Remember, I mentioned that JavaScript was not accessible for screen readers. They had screenshots of tables of results instead of coded tables. I mean, it was 2000, but we did know how to code tables back then. Uh, and SOCOG, basically, Sydney Operating Commission of the Olympic Games, uh, just just ignored him. So it, they actually argued that it would cost $16 million to make the site accessible. Now, contrary to popular belief, I did not then decide to join the accessibility community and make lots of money. Um, but it was something that landed on the front page of every single newspaper. And it was something that really gave accessibility its name. 
Uh, and so what happened is, you know, Bruce Maguire made this complaint and, you know, SOCOG uh, ignored him. And so he took it to the Australian Human Rights Commission. And the Australian Human Rights Commission uh, went to SOCOG and said, hey, you need to fix these things. And uh, SOCOG ignored them. So the Human Rights Commission took SOCOG to court. Now, uh, they actually won. The Australian Human Rights Commission won. And the judge fined them $20,000. And back in 2000, $20,000 was like $3 million. No, it wasn't really. It was probably more like $100,000. Um, he deemed it would have cost $10,000 to make the site accessible. Uh, and so he doubled that figure. Uh, however, he awarded attorney's fees to Maguire um, and the Australian Human Rights Commission, which were over $500,000. So it definitely cost uh, SOCOG a lot of uh, money at that point. Uh, and so it was something that really, you know, put accessibility on the map. You know, people realised that if you didn't have an accessible website, you could have a, su a successful litigation around it. And surprisingly, uh, that was in Australia. And there has never been a successful accessibility litigation in Australia since, unfortunately. Uh, but I'll get onto that later. So I actually joined the uh, web content accessibility guidelines working group in 2000 uh, because it was something that, you know, a lot of people were thinking a lot more about and it was something that I felt that I could contribute. I was uh, invite, I was an invited expert and I worked uh, with the working group until 2006 when the first public draft of the web content accessibility guidelines version 2 was released. And it was incredible incredibly controversial. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of things that a number of members of the accessibility industry did not like. <clears throat> so the first of these was the testability criteria. So the testability criteria was that eight out of 10 accessibility specialists agree on the outcome. Now, this does not mean automated accessibility testing. However, I think we can all agree that eight out of 10 accessibility specialists can't agree on whether the sky is blue at a particular time. So this is something that uh, was really uh, problematic. I actually wrote an article on a list apart uh, about how really testability, I called it testability costs too much if you want to look it up. Um, and I gave the example of alt attributes that, yes, uh, you could say that uh, alt attributes, uh, you know, if they were missing, eight out of 10 accessibility specialists could agree on that, although maybe they couldn't at this point with the whole ARIA described by, but that's another discussion. Uh, I think that's terrible. Anyway, uh, just a little aside, my little ARIA. Uh, soapbox anyway. Uh, but basically the reason why, or not, well, I believe the reason why they had testability uh, is because they didn't like things like uh, ensure your content is uh, simple, uh, you know, use simple content, which was something that was in WCAG 1. And that was the reason why that particular requirement was removed and was not in WCAG 2. Uh, and that was something that we found was really important for people, specifically people with cognitive disabilities. And I knew at that point, because I had learned more about accessibility, that uh, people with cognitive disabilities actually encompass the largest group of people with disabilities who use the web. And so we really wanted to support them. And one of the things that happened is Lisa Seaman, who was also an invited expert, uh, lodged a formal objection, which I and a number of other, I think about 40 other accessibility specialists signed, uh, made, uh, lodged a formal objection to WCAG 2 that said it did not address the needs of people with cognitive disabilities. Now, what's interesting about that is if you delve into the incredible number of pages and content of WCAG 2, you will actually find a clause that says that WCAG 2 is not sufficient in terms of making a site accessible to people with cognitive disabilities and that you need to do additional things outside of WCAG 2 to make it accessible to people with cognitive disabilities. But that kind of got buried in all the other text. Uh, so really the testability requirement was, you know, eight out of 10 accessibility specialists could could not agree on whether content was clear and simple. And my argument was that you could with things like a flesh Kincaid reading, uh, you know, the number of words in a sentence, et cetera, et cetera. And they were like, absolutely not. 
no, uh, it's not testable, therefore it can't be in WCAG 2. Uh, and I, my argument was, well, okay, we can all agree that uh, missing alt attributes, although, as I said before, not maybe all of us, are a failure of WCAG 2. But, you know, if you have an alt attribute of world or an icon of the world, I don't think eight out of 10 accessibility specialists would agree on that, depending on its context. Um, so I basically said WCAG 2 was always going to be fairly subjective and taking out that uh, subjectivity meant that some really important requirements were removed. Um, now that did or did not, but in my opinion did, result in my getting kicked off the working group, uh, which is a really long story and feel free to find me at a conference in the States anytime soon or in Australia if you want to come over and you really want to learn what happened and buy me a drink and I'll tell you all about it. Uh, but basically um, I was removed from um, the working group and uh, that sort of caused a bit of a ruction uh, in the accessibility industry, not because I got picked off, but because uh, I'm not that special, but because WCAG 2 really didn't seem to be uh, addressing these kind of requirements. So what happened was there was this development of what we call the WCAG Samurai Errata, uh, and that was led by Joe Clark. Uh, and he was initially very, uh, or back in the early 2000s, incredibly prolific and involved in the accessibility industry. And he was fairly antagonistic uh, to the W3C. Uh, so he got together a small group of accessibility specialists and they worked on the WCAG Samurai Errata, which was basically WCAG 1.1. So uh, bringing WCAG 1 up into you know, the 2000s. And uh, the contributors were anonymous. Um, but I was asked to present <clears throat> a third party review of the document, uh, which I did. And it's still out there on the web if you want to find it, uh, it maybe just through the Wayback Machine. Uh, so that was something that a lot of people uh, kind of looked at. And it was perhaps one of the reasons why WCAG 2 was not uh, published in 2006, but was actually pulled and done a lot more work and was published in 2008. And I published a blog post called Why I'm Still in, Still Using WCAG 1 in 2008. So it was a very complex, difficult time. Uh, and it was something that I feel like, uh, you know, we all wanted the same thing. And I think that we felt that sometimes corporate interests got in the way. Uh, and that was, you know, something that we all kind of fought very hard about. And it was very different to today. Uh, remember in 2008, WCAG 2 was published only a year after um, the iPhone was released. And I'm actually watching the TV show Revenge at the moment, please don't judge me. And I find they don't use iPhones. They don't have you know, it was released in 2011. They're all using Blackberries and they've got these tiny little screens and they're, you know, monochrome and things like that. So that was even in 2011. When WCAG 2 was written, we really had no concept of what, you know, what the mobile world would become. Things like native apps, using our phones for everything, uh, you know, uh, booking a doctor's appointment online, uh, checking your email, uh, you know, okay, that was on BlackBerry all the time, apparently. Remember, for those people who weren't around, it was called the Crackberry. It was really the, uh, uh, because it was so, as addictive as crack, uh, it was really the precursor to the iPhone, um, but the iPhone really took it to another level. So please be aware that when WCAG 2 was published, there was really no concept of what you know, the mobile device would do. And it didn't really take into account, you know, what uh, the world, what the future would bring. Even though it was supposed to be technology neutral, it was supposed to be the last WCAG. Um, and so, you know, that's something that, you know, it definitely isn't. So another thing that happened in 2008, which was just as controversial, was uh, Target in the US was sued by the National Federation for the Blind. So the National Federation for the Blind argued that the lack of alt text uh, and the requirement that online purchases needed a mouse, you had inaccessible image maps, oh, remember image maps, uh, headings missing, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you know, were meant that uh, people who 
uh, were blind or vision impaired could not make online purchases on the target website. Now, this is not National Federation for the Blind had not woken up someday in 2005 and decided that, uh, sorry, 2008, <laughs> I definitely uh, dropped the punchline there, uh, in 2008 and said, hey, let's sue Target. They had actually been complaining to Target since 2005 uh, and Target had, guess what, ignored them. Uh, you'll see that this is a running theme. Uh, anyway, so they took them to court. National Federation for the Blind took Target to court uh, and basically the judge found when, they when Target tried to throw out the case that although the site was not connected to a single physical place, they are connected enough to be included under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that was something that was really questioned back then, is that uh, the uh, accommodations requirement was basically you need to make accommodations accessible. Uh, and there was a, thing, a concept that if a website was associated with a particular place of purchase, then it needed to be accessible. But, you know, this wasn't really associated with one place of purchase. And so the judge really uh, changed that 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 thought. So they settled actually uh, outside of court. So before the judge ruled uh, for damages of $6 million, which really puts the $10,000 uh, that uh, the $20,000 that the judge issued to shame. But, you know, the US has been a little bit more litigious in a, than Australia. So they settled for damages of $6 million and they also had to pay for the National Federation for the Blind's legal costs, which were $3.5 million. So it really uh, was quite an expensive uh, outing for Target. <clears throat> and then the most important thing in the accessibility industry happened. 2011, Accessibility Oz was founded. That's all I have to say. Anyway. A year later, 2012, Netflix was sued by the National Association for the Deaf. And so this was the first time a company was sued that didn't have an associated public location. In fact, Netflix didn't have any public uh, locations. So basically, Netflix threw everything at this lawsuit. They argued that there was no public accommodation. They, re they argued that it would be a copyright violation to provide captions to their videos, uh, even if the captions already existed. Uh, and so basically they lost. Uh, that's the short version. They were required to provide captions to all videos by... Uh, 2014, so they had 18 months to do it, and $795,000 of damages were awarded. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is uh, really, it really did uh, light a fire under Netflix. Uh, basically, everything has captions um, in Netflix as well, but it also kind of went a little bit further. So in 2015, uh, about a year after Netflix uh, added captions to everything, they released a TV show called Daredevil. And it's about, if you don't know about it, a blind superhero. Um, and it's actually really quite interesting. And I was initially annoyed that they didn't actually use a blind person to play the role, but he actually acts like he's not blind because of various reasons, superhero being part of it. Uh, so it was released in 2015. And so just like people who are deaf or hard of hearing need captions to watch videos, uh, people who are blind or vision impaired need audio descriptions, which describe what's visually occurring on the screen. Now, uh, I think that someone who is blind or vision impaired would probably be interested in watching a TV show about a blind superhero, but Daredevil was released without audio descriptions, uh, which caused a bit of a kerfuffle in the accessibility industry. Um, uh, however, Three days later, they uh, Netflix actually did release audio descriptions for Daredevil, and they are absolutely brilliant. If you want to know what really brilliant audio descriptions are, have a look at Daredevil or have a listen to Daredevil. So it's uh, my opinion, remember all my opinion, that uh, it was actually a bit of a stunt by uh, Netflix that there's no way they could have gotten those uh, audio descriptions done in three days. So I think they definitely uh, had it up and ready before and decided to hold it. So they got a little bit of publicity, as they say, no publicity is bad plus publicity. 
So the next thing that really happened, and, you know, I feel that I need to mention this because, you know, Australian, uh, in 2014, Coles was sued. Coles is kind of like your uh, Trader Joe's, uh, Woolworth's, uh, Albertsons kind of Safeway, uh, one of those kind of big grocery conglomerates. There's really only two in Australia, Woolworths and Coles, Woolworths owned by Safeway. Uh, so Coles was sued um, in Australia. Uh, so basically what had happened is it was very similar to the issue with Target, the issue, the court case against Target. Uh, a vision impaired woman, Giselle Menage, she had worked several years with Coles at her own, you know, time and cost. She never got paid to make sure that the site was accessible so she could order her groceries online. Uh, and it was by early 2014. That was great. Uh, however, then they released a new website mid-2014, which was not accessible. Uh, and we do see this a lot. You know, people work really hard to make uh, one system accessible and then they don't actually think about what they need to do when they bring in a new system. Because as I like to say, you don't think, don't make things accessible accidentally. You do have to actually work at it. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is that the Australian Human Rights Commission had kind of decided to mediate out any kind of legal disputes around accessibility. Uh, they did not want to go down the path of litigation again. However, this coincided with our uh, Conservative government uh, laying off the Disability Discrimination Commissioner from the Australian Human Rights Commission, which is really interesting because the Australian Human Rights Commission deals with about six or seven major discrimination issues. So, you know, race, gender, sexuality, uh, disability, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and 47% of the complaints that it receives have to do with disability. So you think they'd have a disability discrimination commissioner, but anyway. So they, they laid off this disability discrimination commissioner. And so Giselle Minaj, who had been uh, contacting Coles and working with Coles through the Australian Human Rights Commission, really went, oh, you are kidding. I, that's my interpretation. And so she actually sued them because that's the next step if you can't mediate it out. Um, and so once again, that was actually settled out of court uh, for an undisclosed sum. Uh, and they have worked very hard to make themselves uh, much more accessible today. And so that also lit a bit of a fire in the accessibility industry in Australia. The more global phenomenon of 2014 was EN301549, which was basically the equivalent of Section 508, but for the EU. So this required that public procurement of all EU ICT products and services were, you know, were accessible. Uh, and so that's something that you might think, oh my gosh, a whole other set of guidelines. But when it comes to web, it does refer to the web content accessibility guidelines. Uh, and it, But it does go a lot far further. So it talks about, say, the accessibility of photocopiers, uh, you know, the accessibility of mobile devices, the accessibility of actual, you know, handheld telephone landlines. Uh, so that does go into a lot more detail. But when it comes to web, it was referring to WCAG. The same year, the BBC rela released the mobile accessibility guidelines. So as I mentioned, we really didn't, uh, you know, know what the world would uh, bring when we worked on uh, the web content accessibility guidelines. And there's a lot of things that, you know, we missed. Uh, and and one of those things, for example, is the keyboard requirement. So there's a requirement that everything be accessible via the keyboard in WCAG, but there's no requirement that everything be accessible via the mouse or that everything be accessible via touch. And so this was something that the entire accessibility industry was very aware of. And so the BBC came together and worked on and developed these mobile accessibility guidelines. However, one of the things that I personally found difficult, and I think a lot of uh, people found difficult, was that they had merged the native app and the mobile site requirements. Uh, so you couldn't really tell if something was a you know, native app requirement or a mobile site requirement. Uh, but they did have code examples in there, which was great. Uh, and that was something that a lot of people used for a long time. 
um, until about a year or two ago when the BBC came out and said, oh, we never expected for other people to use these. These were only for our internal use, uh, which I think is a little bit surprising. Uh, but uh, it was something that, I mean, at Accessibility Oz, uh, we used them until we developed our own set of guidelines and they were very important to the industry. Sorry, excuse me. No problem. <laughs> The next thing that really happened was that in 2017, the BPAT 2 was released. So the voluntary product associate, uh, <laughs> the voluntary product assessment template version 2, once again developed in partnership with the US government, General Services Administration, and the Information Technology Information Council. And it incorporated WCAG 2 and EN301549. And it included multiple standards and separate versions for each standard and also evaluation methods used. So this way you could actually use your VPAT for more physical products uh, similar to EN301549. But when it came to web accessibility, the interesting thing was really the evaluation methods. So not only could you say, or not only did, were you expected to say, yes, we meet this requirement, you also need to say, how do we figure out that we meet this requirement? So, you know, we just randomly know accessibility accidentally, it doesn't really, you know, fly. You have to say we tested with this and we, you know, tested with these people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that was a big change. And then a year later, WCAG 2.1 was released uh, and it did address issues around, wait for it, people with cognitive disabilities uh, and also mobile accessibility. Uh, however, it was really felt that the needs of people with low vision were left out. Um, and as I said, uh, WCAG 2 is applicable to mobile. <clears throat> Um, however, it's not, uh, you know, 100%. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it has accessibility requirements around keyboard uh, access, but not touchscreen or mouse access. And so what actually happened is in 2017, uh, the members of the ICT Accessibility Testing Symposium got together in a town hall at the end of the conference and decided that as a community, as an industry, that we really needed to develop a set of mobile accessibility guidelines. So 2018, a few months after we had 2.1, was released the first ICT mobile testing methodology. And it really was an amalgamation of current standards. So we talked to all the big and small accessibility firms. We asked ask them uh, what methodologies they use for mobile accessibility and we amalgamated them. Uh, and so that was something that, you know, I, I was chair of and it's something that we worked very hard at because we were really aware that WCAG 2 did not support the needs of people, of mobile device, needs of people on mobile devices. But we really thought this was a short-term thing. We really thought that once WCAG 2.1 was released, then, you know, we could go off on our separate lives and have some of our spare time back. Uh, but that was unfortunately not to be the case. So, for example, WCAG 2.1 does build on, you know, mobile accessibility. Uh, however, it really doesn't go far enough. So uh, basically, <clears throat> sorry, just one second. I just want to delete that slide. No problem. So basically, so basically one of the things that everyone agreed on uh, when we put these mobile guidelines together was the requirement of touch target size. So for example, if you look at your mobile device, that you have an adequate touch target size when you're you know, trying to activate an item. Uh, every single one of the guidelines uh, had that requirement in it. And it was in WCAG 2.1, but it was in level AAA. Uh, and as I like to say, level AAA is where success criterion go to die. And so basically, the community itself, the industry itself was quite upset about WCAG 2.1 and how it did not 
really address the needs so appropriately. And, you know, that does happen when you're operating as a committee, especially one as large as the W3C. There are a lot of excellent uh, requirements that were going to be in WCAG 2.1 and were going to be in WCAG 2.2 that basically got removed uh, because people, all the people couldn't agree on them. And so that was one of them. So we reformed the committees and we actually then developed two sets of guidelines and we didn't just amalgamate requirements. We got people together and we talked to them about exactly what it was that we thought that people needed. And we released two sets of guidelines, one on mobile site accessibility and one on native app accessibility. So those are available on the Accessibility Oz website and the ICT Accessibility Testing Symposium website. Um, and we definitely strongly recommend that you use them. And we're reforming the committee uh, to develop a third version. And also in 2020, VPAT 2.4 was released and this incorporated WCAG 2.1. And then nothing else happened because, you know, 2020, really quite a boring year. Nothing really happened. So at the end, of course, I'm only joking. Uh, April 2022, WCAG 2.2 was released. Actually, no, sorry. Uh, September 2022, WCAG 2.2, no, sorry. November 2022, WCAG 2.2 was released. No, sorry. February 2023, WCAG 2.2 was released. No, sorry. April 2023, WCAG 2 was released. No, sorry. At some stage, WCAG 2.2 was literally released. And, uh, you know, I, I know it's probably very hard. I am being very, very harsh on the W3C. But, uh, you know, we do need to move faster than this. Uh, it took one year to, or, you know, it took, well, it took three years to develop eight versions of the first set of web accessibility guidelines. It took one year to take that from version eight to version to WCAG 1. Then it took nine years to take that from WCAG 1 to WCAG 2.2. And then it took 10 years to take it from WCAG 2 to WCAG 2.1. And we're going on about five years now to take it from WCAG 2.1 to 2.2. So I think we really need to move faster than that. I don't have a suggestion on how to do that, uh, other than joining the mobile committee that I um, am trying to reform at the moment. Uh, but it is something that I think that people need to think about, that these guidelines need to move a lot faster. You've got uh, VPATs um, being updated, you got Section 508 being updated and EN 301549 being updated. WCAG can't move this slowly. So thank you for that. I do really feel like the world kind of ended in 2020, so I don't have much for the last three years, but I don't think I'm alone in that, uh, you know, in that estimation. Uh, so thank you very, very much. Uh, I I'm very happy to have been able to present this to you. Please, please note that all the sassiness is my own. Um, don't hold it against anyone. Uh, this is my take on the situation. Uh, I don't want death threats or flame wars or being doxxed. Thank you. Not, although that doesn't really happen a lot in the accessibility industry, I'm very happy to say. So thank you very much for having me and uh, I will see you at my next presentation. <laughs>